Hey, my uh, fellow historians, welcome back to this lesson 18 or chapter 18 mini lesson. Uh, if you would make sure you have your notes out with you as we go through this uh, to be keeping track of where you're at. So this will be the last one for unit two, the last one for the progressive era. And so let's do a quick recap of where we are at this point in the history. So right at the turn of the century, early 1900s, and what it is we're looking at is the United States has rapidly grown, both because of the massive number of immigrants who have come, but also because of the industrial growth. The United States is becoming a manufacturing powerhouse. Um, whatever it is you're talking about, there's a good chance it was built in the good old U.S. of A. Um, but along with that, there's been some problems, and many of those problems have come in the form of um, not only political corruption, but also uh, business practices being improper, whether it's um, these monopolies and trusts that have formed that are just really uh, making it difficult for anyone but those particular companies to get ahead. Uh, you also have social problems that have been arising, whether it is racial tensions or religious tensions or uh, ethnic tensions that have arisen. So we have different groups that are trying to kind of uh, give themselves and their particular group um, some uh, power uh, or even just to be recognized in general. We have uh, women, females, they're working to get the vote. Um, and, uh, so different groups are really trying to to rise up and have a have a say in our government. We were created to be a democracy where everyone has a voice, and they're really trying to make it so everybody do ha does have a voice. So what we're going to look at today then is three presidents. We're all going to be out of Chapter 18 um, in your text, and so if you want to follow along with me, please follow along with me. I'll be highlighting your main and your key points. So we're going to look this afternoon at three main presidents. That'd be Theodore Roosevelt, also known as Teddy Roosevelt, um, Howard Taft, and then we're going to be looking at uh, William Howard Taft. Then we're going to be looking at uh, Woodrow Wilson. These three are what are known as the progressive presidents. So let's quickly start by looking at Theodore Roosevelt. To me, one of the most fascinating presidents because he's just not your traditional president. He was. Um, he was rough. He was rugged. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty uh, by actually getting out and doing what needed to get done. Also, um, a number of books I've read on him talks about just his desire to be out in nature. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt is one of those guys that really started the trend and really in general started to push for national parks and to have um, our, our environment be taken care of. Uh, there was even a time after he'd spent a little bit of time in politics that he went out to South Dakota and he started his own cattle ranch just because he wanted to um, see what it was like to be a cowboy. And so he had he had substantial wealth and so he moved out, started his own cattle rancher for a few years, ran a cattle ranch, and then came back to Washington to uh, get back in politics. And so he's a guy that very, very, very fascinating. Even after two terms of president, him and one of his sons uh, went and explored uh, one of the only unmapped rivers in the Amazon rainforest, which I think is really, really neat. Fascinating. There's a great book by a gal named Candace Millard. Um, she wrote, she's a local author, actually from Leewood here, wrote about Teddy Roosevelt and his journeys uh, to the Amazon rainforest and the challenges he had while navigating the Amazon uh, rivers. And this was after he already spent two terms as president. So Teddy Roosevelt, uh, one of the youngest presidents in American history, becomes president, as it says, after uh, William McKinley is assassinated in 1901. Teddy Roosevelt steps in at 42, and so he's just a really a loud, boisterous guy. Uh, one of the things that made Teddy so famous is this thing called the Square Deal. As it says, it's his reform program focused on regulating big business, protecting workers and consumers, and preserving the environment. And so uh, Teddy's goal is to kind of uh, not only get the power back to people, but also protect people as well along with the I do want to show you a short video about Teddy Roosevelt here, and so I'm going to put that up on screen for you. To... Six months after being elected president for the second time, William McKinley was assassinated, and his running mate, 42-year-old Vice President Theodore Roosevelt, succeeded him in 1901. He was the youngest person ever to hold that office. Roosevelt was born into a wealthy family. And although he suffered from asthma, he was determined to live an active life. From marksmanship, to horseback riding and tennis, to boxing and hunting, to his heroic exploits with the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt proved a popular leader. First as governor of New York, and then as president. 
When asked why people so adored him, he said he thought it was because... I put into words what is in their hearts and minds, but not their mouths. Roosevelt outlined many progressive reforms to the American public and gave his plan a name, the Square Deal. When Roosevelt assumed office, over 80% of American business was owned by trusts. Although Congress had already enacted the Sherman Antitrust Act, it had not stopped the trusts from using unfair business practices to destroy their competition. Roosevelt began by suing the Northern Securities Railroad Trust. And in 1904, the Supreme Court agreed that the trust had become a monopoly and ordered it dissolved. Roosevelt's administration filed over 40 more suits. They pursued the beef industry, Standard Oil, the American Tobacco Company, and many other trusts. Americans overwhelmingly returned Roosevelt to the presidency in 1904. As he continued his work as a trust buster and a staunch proponent of governmental regulation of business. The many other progressives who were serving in local, state, and federal government helped Roosevelt to get the support he needed to get his proposed laws passed, like Mayor Samuel Golden Rule Jones of Toledo, Ohio, Governors Charles Acock of North Carolina, Albert Cummins of Iowa, and Fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin both of whom became United States Senators. Two years after his re-election, Roosevelt saw the Hepburn Act become law, which gave the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission the power to regulate the maximum fees railroads could charge. Roosevelt next turned his attention to questions surrounding public health. Like most Americans, he was horrified when he read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and even considered becoming a vegetarian. He appointed a commission to investigate Sinclair's claims. A man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go in the hoppers together. Sinclair's charges of unsanitary conditions proved to be true. The commission confirmed his description of potted ham as a hash containing ground rope and pigskin. So in 1906, with Roosevelt's urging, Congress adopted the Meat Inspection Act. Federal inspectors would now guarantee safe, sanitary meat. That same year, more reforms followed with the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Manufacturers now had to list the contents of foods and drugs on labels and could not make exaggerated claims about a medicine's benefits. No deleterious drug, chemical, or preservative could be used in medicines or foods. Roosevelt brought the same enthusiasm to protecting America's natural resources that he did to leveling the business playing field. After graduating from Harvard University, a young Theodore Roosevelt had worked as a cattle rancher in the Dakotas. He quickly realized that ranchers were allowing cattle to overgraze the Great Plains that farmers had cut down forests and plowed under the prairies, and that America's natural resources were being squandered. What will happen when our forests are gone, when the coal, the iron, the oil, and the gas are exhausted? As president, Roosevelt withdrew 148 million acres of forest land from public sale, an area larger than Germany. On the advice of his friend, naturalist John Muir, Roosevelt established over 50 wildlife sanctuaries, five national parks, and designated 18 national monuments. He also put fellow conservationist Gifford Pinchot in charge of supervising the national forests. The nation was obsessed by a fury of development. The American Colossus was fiercely intent on appropriating and exploiting the riches of the richest of all continents. Roosevelt was so determined that Americans realized that the country's resources were not endless that he even banned Christmas trees in the White House. Theodore Roosevelt ignored tradition and redefined the image and scope of the President of the United States. He chose to be vibrant, visible, and accessible. Roosevelt was the people's choice throughout America, and in turn, America allowed him to use what he called his bully pulpit to accomplish his goals of reform and governmental regulation. However, a third term as president wasn't in keeping with tradition. 
So bowing to President, Roosevelt instead handpicked his success. All right, guys, that uh, gives you a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt. So after Theodore Roosevelt, he does handpick a man uh, named William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft was a very, very different president than uh, was um, Theodore Roosevelt. Just different in many, many ways. So I want to show you a short video then about William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft, who easily won the presidency in 1908. Taft shared Roosevelt's progressive beliefs, if not his overwhelming popularity. His much more conservative approach to reform disappointed not only the more progressive members of his own party, but the public at large. The fact that the third party candidate, socialist Eugene Debs, received almost a half a million votes for president was a clear indication that a great many Americans wanted more radical change than even Roosevelt had pioneered. Now, under Taft's leadership, they felt cheated. Although he was physically large, six feet tall and 350 pounds, Taft was no match for the size of Roosevelt's personality and popularity with voters. Taft was a distinguished lawyer and judge, but timid and uncomfortable as a politician. When he lost re-election to Woodrow Wilson in 1912, he returned to his real love, the law, and became the only ex-president to have been chosen as a chief justice of the Supreme Court. He said the White House was the loneliest place in the world. I don't remember that I ever was president. Taft's one term as president was not without success, but the bitter political wrangling within his own party distracted the public's attention. Taft actually broke up more than twice the number of trusts as Roosevelt during his presidency. He convinced Congress to pass the Mann-Elkins Act, giving the Interstate Commerce Commission the ability to regulate telephone and telegraph companies. And he urged Congress to pass the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, a federal income tax. It was ratified by the states a year after he left office. Still, Taft was more sympathetic to the demands of the conservatives in the Republican Party than the progressives, and the public believed he was failing to continue Roosevelt's reforms. They were outraged when Taft signed the Payne-Aldrich Tariff, raising prices on imported goods, and incensed when Taft fired Gifford Pinchot. When Theodore Roosevelt returned to America from overseas in 1910, he was given a hero's welcome. The public urged him to seek a third term as president, and two years later, he did. However, the Republican Party refused to seat Roosevelt's delegates to their convention, and as a result, Taft was renominated as a presidential candidate on the first ballot. Furious, Roosevelt and his supporters formed their own political party, aptly named the Progressive Party. After, Roosevelt boasted, I'm as strong as a bull moose and ready for the fight. The Progressive Party then became known as the Bull Moose Party. Former friends and party members, now political enemies, Taft and Roosevelt battled each other for votes. Taft called Roosevelt a dangerous egotist, while Roosevelt said Taft was a fathead with the brain of a guinea pig. Meanwhile, the Democratic reform governor, now presidential candidate Woodrow Wilson, championed his own progressive program called the New Freedom to American Voters, and wisely steered clear of the bickering between Roosevelt and Taft. Don't interfere when your enemy is destroying itself. With the Republican Party vote split between Taft and Roosevelt, Wilson won a majority of the Electoral College votes and became president. I don't know, so as long as you make sure you caught all that, the basic storyline, Roosevelt serves two terms. Sorry, Roosevelt serves two terms as president, uh, but because it wasn't normal for a guy to serve three, he stepped down for one. He picked who he thought would be the best successor for him in line with his ideology, which was William Howard Taft. Well, it turns out Taft was just not quite what uh, he thought he was going to be uh, when he got into office. And so when it came back around for Taft, re-election Roosevelt wanted to have the opportunity to stand in uh, for the Republican Party instead of Taft well the Republicans did not go for it so um, 
Teddy Roosevelt decided to start his own party called the uh, Progressive Party, which then became known as the Bull Moose Party. That essentially split the vote within the Republicans, half towards Taft, half towards, Will or towards Roosevelt, and then a new guy came in, uh, this Woodrow Wilson, which let me show you a short thing about Woodrow Wilson. Wilson set to work with much success. He convinced the Senate to pass the Underwood Simmons Tariff, which for the first time since the Civil War reduced tariff rates. Next, he pursued financial reform by establishing a private banking system under federal control to make credit more available throughout the country and quickly adjust the amount of money in circulation. The Federal Reserve System was one of Wilson's greatest achievements and is the cornerstone of our economy even today. The next year, Wilson helped establish the Federal Trade Commission and signed into law the Clayton Antitrust Act. Both the commission and the act were aimed at stopping unfair business practices. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of all three of these presidents, Roosevelt, uh, Taft and Wilson, all a little bit different in what they did, but all moving towards that progressive mindset. Now, again, to make sure we're all um, understanding, the big thing the progressives did is really work towards ending and busting the trusts so these trusts did not become too dominant, so they did not um, take over. As you can see, the, um, the busted trust over here in the left-hand column, look at that chart of the things that uh, they worked towards ending, trying to get more power back to the people. Okay, one of the other big areas that they really work towards all together is protecting the environment, preserving the environment, conserving the environment, adding lots of new parks. And so here's the picture with the different parks that were added. Hopefully you've been to some of these. The final thing to look at then is how they all impacted, how they all impacted the banking system. Uh, President Wilson being the man that created the Federal Reserve Bank in which um, all banks operate independently but there still is an overarching authority over all of them. It says the Central Bank and Authority of the United States, which manages the nation's money supply. So these three guys all work towards creating a, a more level playing field for the United States, not only business-wise, but also socially, trying to create an environment that was uh, welcoming to, to everybody. One of the things that we got to make sure you understand, um, and make sure you have notes over being, there's four amendments that come into play here. First one being your 16th Amendment. 16th Amendment established during this time period is when we have the income tax, a graduate income tax, which means the more money you make, the more you're taxed. Still in favor today. So if you only make, make a low amount of money, you'll get taxed very little. If you make a lot of money, you get taxed a lot. Still highly debated today. Other one being the 17th Amendment. 17th Amendment is the direct election of U.S. Senators um, in which this is one of the ideals that you, you should have had from last unit uh, or last section. The idea being that uh, the people get to uh, vote for senators. The people have more of a voice. Next one being the 18th Amendment, which is prohibition, the banning of alcohol. We know from we talked about this earlier, this did not last, but 18th Amendment bans alcohol. And then one of the great ones, the 19th Amendment, which was gives women the right to vote. So again, you have your 16th Amendment, which is income tax, your 17th Amendment, which is direct election of senators, your 18th Amendment, prohibition, and your 19th Amendment, women's rights to vote. So there you go, folks. There's our, our progressive presidents. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting and informative.